So, um, hello everyone. Um, welcome to this um, session on structural and functional connectivity, in which uh, we will have three speakers. And um, uh, just to remind you uh, how this works, that um, um, you can ask a question at the bottom where there's ask a question um, button, uh, button. And um, uh, you can also upvote uh, those questions and the questions that have the most votes, uh, I will ask them to the speakers in the end. And so without further ado, I will invite the first speaker on screen, who is um, Stuart Oldham. And um, he will talk about um, a spatial developmental generative model of human brain structural connectivity. He is connecting at the moment. Am I here? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, would you like to start your presentation? Certainly. Just give me one second. Okay. Hopefully, you should be sharing the screen now. Yes, I see it. Awesome. Well, I'm ready to start whenever. Yes, take it away. All right, well. Thank you everyone for coming along or wherever you are in the world. So today I'm going to be presenting on some of my PhD work, which looks at um, developing generative models of human brain structural connectivity. So as I'm sure we're all probably well aware, the human brain is very complex. It has some um, um, 100, billion, um, 100 billion neurons and some 100 trillion synapses. And the way in which these are all connected it allows us to have our cognition, our behavior, our consciousness. So the way they are connected and the manner in which they come to be connected is something really important to understand. So for me, I primarily investigate whole brain macro scale stru structural connectivity. This type of connectivity refers to the white matter pathways that connect different regions of the brain. We can understand this connectivity by representing it as a network of nodes and edges. So for humans, we primarily construct this network from MRI data. So one of the modalities we use is diffusion-weighted imaging. Now, diffusion-weighted imaging is sensitive to the diffusion of water. Water diffuses parallel to barriers, and in the brain's white matter, this barrier primarily consists of axons. And we can, from this, we can infer the direction of white matter pathways. We run a process known as tractography, which follows these directions of diffusion, indicated by these yellow ellipsoids here, which are called tensors. And this produces a streamline, which acts as a potential white matter pathway. And basically what we do is we generate millions of these streamlines to give us complete coverage of the entire brain. And this is known as a tractogram. And we can combine this tractogram with a parcellation. So in the parcellation, we divide up the brain into different regions according to um, either like their sulcal garai features, their psychoarchitecture, some kind of functional network, or you can even do it randomly. There's a number of ways you can do it. And then to create a network, what we do is we combine the tractogram and this parcellation together. So we take the regions of our parcellation and they become the nodes of our network. Then we assess whether the corresponding regions in the network, in, in the parcellation, if there's streamlines connecting them. And if there are, we can form an edge between those. And so from this, we can construct a network. And once we have our structural connectivity represented in this way, you can ask questions about its organization. So for instance, we can ask um, what kind of, how are particular elements in it arranged? What kind of topological properties does it have? And we in network neuroscience are very good at describing all these different kinds of topological properties. So for instance, we've got node degree, we had a node's degree is how many connections it has. In particular, we're interested in these nodes with a high number of connections, which are known as hubs, as they are very important to overall brain functioning. We can also have other properties like community structure, where you tend to have groups of nodes that are very densely connected amongst themselves. So, as I said, we're very good at describing how all these different features, but we're becoming interested in understanding, we wanted to know how does the brain actually form 
these particular features? And more broadly, how does the brain's particular pattern of connectivity emerge? Well, to do this, we this is a really age-old question. So it's really been answered last since sort of the beginning of neuroscience with Santiago Romani Kiao. And he, from his micro observations of the microscope, came up with these three laws of conservation. It's con laws of conservation of time, space, and material. So neurons are sort of arranged to conserve, basically minimize the amount of transmission time signals take, the amount of space they take up, and the amount of material they use. Now, these ideas have of sort of suggest that there are some sort of wiring costs to how connections are formed. So how does this translate to a network neuroscience um, approach? Well, we can clearly see this wiring cost when we look at the connection probability as a function of distance in different brains. So here we're looking at the mouse, macaque, and human. And as we look at the distance between two regions and we assess how many connections of that distance are there, we see this characteristic exponential decay, which suggests that there are there, that wiring costs have some kind of key constraint on how these systems are forming. But how can we go further? Well, we can use what are known as generative models. So a generative model basically ties to generate a network according to a rule. In this case, the rule is saying that the probability of a connection forming between nodes I and J depends on some exponent of the distance between them. And this exponent is influenced by this eta parameter, which is typically modeled as a decay reason that I just showed. And so under this model, so you've got an eta of um, negative 0.4. And if we generate a network under this, we get mostly short range connections, but some long range connections. As we increase the strength of this decay, we get more and more short range connections. And as we reduce the strength of this decay, we get more and more um, long range connections. And so you can see there's a huge wide variety of different networks that we can get by changing these parameters. But how do we know if this model can give us a network that most closely resembles our empirical data? Well, to do that, we need to compare our model and our data. And typically, we do this by we take some of those topological properties I was talking about before, and we measure them as a histogram, and we measure their distributions. We can then convert these distributions to a cumulative distribution function. And basically what we're doing is we're looking for the maximal difference across these different properties. In other words, this is basically a kolmogorov smirnov test. And so we look at this maximal difference amongst our different properties, and that becomes an indication of our model sort of model fit. And then we use some sort of optimization scheme where we searched all these different parameters, evaluating their fits with the aim of trying to identify some parameters that indicate the, that give us a network with the best possible fit. Now, these sort of networks that are just simply to model distance have sort of been superseded. They've been shown to that basically trying to minimize or wiring costs is not how networks are formed. Instead, we need these so-called trade-offs models where distance is weighted against the functional value. And this functional value is usually proxied by some topological form. So for instance, this topological value would be, you know, the product of the two degrees of two no nodes multiplied by the distance between them, that gives you the probability. So we see over here in purple, this geometric model, which is what, well, similar to what I was just showing you before, is the worst performing model of all of these. And the best performing ones are these so-called homophily models. And these homophily models are trying to make it so that nodes with similar neighbors are more likely to become connected. And so this is sort of where this field is sort of at, but there's a number of issues that sort of need to be resolved. The first is in how these models are formulated. So I just showed you that this model, that these trade-offs models were formulated as a multiplication of terms. There's an issue with the multiplication of these terms. So for instance, as we increase this topological value, and so what happens is that the effects are not evenly distributed across distance. So basically short range connections more will be more benefited by increasing topology values than long range connections. And this is something which ideally we should understand this model as basically the, the the topological value should be able to overcome distance effects. And here, we're not really seeing that play out in this multiplicative form. It's also difficult to interpret the parameters in this model. So we change it to an additive formulation. So now we have this alpha parameter, which is basically um, adding as a trade-off controlling how much influence the um, topological term has. And under this formulation, we can see that the effects of topology can now be more evenly distributed across the distance. So the next issue is developmental processes. So 
currently these models, the only physical data or biophysical data we're taking in is the actual distance between nodes. But we know that when connections are forming, the brain is growing in both size and changing in shape significantly. As we've just seen that distance is a really critical factor in shaping the connectivity of brains. Therefore, if it's changing over time, that's probably really important. So to model this, we obtained um, scans of fetuses while in the room from 28 one weeks all the way up to 38 weeks, which is really good because this is the period when most connections are forming. And basically what we want to do is we want to measure the how these distances between nodes are changing over time. So basically we need to know where a region is across all these time points. And to do this, we use an algorithm known as multimodal surface matching. Basically the way this works is you take two brains and you project some feature onto them. In this case, we're calculating the so-called depth. And you project these surfaces to a sphere. And then what the MSM algorithm tries to do is basically align the features of one sphere to those on the other. So basically, you know where one part of the sphere would be on, on the other. And conversely, you can know where one brain, what part of one brain would be on another brain. And this is handy because we have our parcellation data on the adult surface. So what we can do is then we can project that to each, um, each of those time points. And so we can see how basically each of the, where those regions are throughout development and corresponding measure how the distances between those regions is changing. So the next issue we sought to address was cross-validating model fit and to deal with sort of the issue of overfitting. One issue with this pre with the previous approach is it's optimized only on a single network. This is problematic um, for one reason because the some models have different parameters than others. So for instance, the spatial model, that geometric model only has one free parameter while all those topological models have two free parameters. So potentially there could be overfitting done by these topological um, models. So to get around this, we do a cross-validation procedure where we to run the optimization for each individual participant, we identify the best parameters. We then take all those best parameters for every other participant bar one, and then we generate a network with those parameters and fit them to that left out participants network. And so this gives us different, a lot of model fits. And we repeat this procedure a um, hundred times. And then we mean across all these iterations and then we mean again to basically get a cross-validated fit for each individual participant. And so, and this prime, this value is what I'll probably be referring to going forward. The final issue also contains about the evaluation. So currently most of these models are just simply evaluated by seeing how well they replicate the distributions of topological properties. But we know in neural net that in these neurological networks that these topological properties are spatially embedded and that spatial position, spatial positioning matters. So for instance, here I'm showing no degree and these dark red areas are the hub nodes. And we know that the positioning of these hub nodes is really important. However, we don't know how well these generative models replicate the spatial distribution of hubs. So this was something we further sought out to see. So then just to quickly recap, we were aiming to compare additive versus multiplicative models and growth versus the static models. So in a growth, we're basically starting at the earliest time point, measuring those distances, generating some connections, then we're using connections, the distances from the next time point, generating more connections and continuing on and on to get the adult size. And under the static model, we're only using the adult distances. So we run it, the model on each piston, optimizing, finding the best parameters, do our cross validation and to evaluate model performance. And then we correlate the degree of each of the models of the model networks to the degree of the corresponding empirical network to see how well it replicates the spectrum distribution. So our first result is looking at this additive versus multiplicative formulations. And what we can see here is that the best additive formulations outperform all the best multiplicative formulations. So these models in green, these matches in, matching in neighbors models are the best. And this matches with what previous results have shown as well. And so this sort of is encouraging because it's just that our formulation is doing what it's supposed to. It's better able to, being better able to generate those long range connections and therefore produce better fits than these other models. So that's good, that's encouraging. When we look at how well we're doing in our static versus growth case, we see that it's not so good. We see that there's really not much differentiation here. What we're seeing is that static and growth cases are basically producing very similar fits. 
And why is this? Well, if we look at the EDA parameters of these models, we sort of see why that for these growth models, the EDA parameter is producing a much stronger decay. And this makes sense. So basically, this the stronger, the stronger decay is countering actually in the fact that for the most part, the distances between nodes in this growth model is smaller. So the model is sort of counteracting that effect of growth. And so as a quick summary of the shown, so we're seeing that basically additive models are outperforming more duplicative, but static and growth are performing very similar. And so that's based on model fits, and so fitting those distributions. What about if we look at how well it's capturing the spatial distribution of nodes? So to do this, we just we took the best performing network for each participant and we calculated its degree and correlated that with the corresponding empirical degree. And what we see is that these best performing models are doing a very poor job of capturing the spatial positioning of um, nodal degree. You know, averaging close to zero and even slightly negative. But potentially in that or in our entire parameter space, there might be networks which are producing better correlations. And indeed there are, but they are few and far between. And they're not that much of an improvement. So usually we're hovering around 0.4. Our best network we're ever getting is only producing correlation of 0.57. And I'm showing that here. And even you can see from this that it's still not producing an especially good fit. So you can see that in the empirical network, there are clear hubs, those dark red regions, where in the while in this best network with the highest correlation, you can't see really real clear hubs emerging. So that's a real problem for these networks. So there are, I guess, subtleties to my results, which I'll quickly unpack. So the first thing to note is that additive model, an additive model formulation can improve fits. Um, we also see that growth models do not do better than our simple static models at replicating the um, top, statistical topological features of the brain. And this is because that beta parameter has counteracted that. And also, probably the most crucial thing is that these general models are not reproducing the exact spatial positioning of hubs or nodal degree. And given that we're trying to say that these models are doing a, are basically uh, accounting for the mechanisms which generate um, brain networks, the fact that they can't generate this crucial property is problematic. So where to next? How can we address this? Well, the first thing we can do is we can look at this idea of heterogeneity, so differences in the timing of connections. So this is work really pioneered by Alexander Gulas, and he has showed that basically if some regions form, start forming connections better than others, you get better fits in a, on a variety of topological properties to a bunch of different empirical networks. So potentially this suggests that this could interact with growth in some way, that some regions might start forming connections in an earlier time point and take advantage of those shorter distances. Another possible avenue we could pursue is work done by my colleague, Irina Anakevachute, who has looked at basically the gene expression of hubs and notes that basically the connections between hub links, which these so-called rich links, have a much stronger gene expression than other areas in the brain. And so this suggests that potentially we could use some kind of um, genetic constraint into our model to help it perform, help improve its performance. And so with that, I'd like to end it there. I'd just like to quickly acknowledge my supervisors, Professor Alex Benito, Dr. Ben Fulcher, Dr. Kevin McQueeno, and also my collaborators, Dr. Arena Anavika Vitate and Dr. Rosa Chisigura. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Uh, we, in principle, have time for a question or two. But uh, no questions were asked uh, by, by the public. You can still do this. Or otherwise, uh, yeah, I'll ask my questions. So um, in principle, um, the, the, the connectivity should be optimized. Um, uh, you know, the resulting connectivity should be optimized. Uh, so do you think that even if you might find a nice formulation using such a developmental model that uh, using a different um, criteria, uh, you could also use a static model and, and find uh, something very close to the actual network structure. And if so, uh, what kind of criteria would you use perhaps? Uh, so are you talking sort of like, sort of like how we are evaluating the model? Um, I'm talking about um, that 
um, the, it's the it's the resulting network, the the network that results after development that should be optimized, so that yeah. we should also be able to formulate some criteria that uh, describe that optimality somehow and uh, describe the network structure. Uh, so I guess that's I think that's sort of so basically we're choosing properties of we're having our adult network and we're choosing some properties of them which are basically trying to get our different networks to um, optimize so in this case we're choosing things like the degree distribution the age length distribution so we're taking that from the actual adult data and we're trying to make both our growth and static models optimized that i guess one thing we're sort of interested in doing but we don't really have the data to do it is sort of have what we might call like checkpoints. So if we had, you know, a network at 21 weeks, we could assess how well our model is doing at 21 weeks, see if that's reasonably accurate, go to 22 weeks, see, do the same again in 23 weeks. So that's something that we're thinking about. But again, the data is currently, it's coming, but it's not there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again very much. We have to move on, unfortunately, already. So uh, there were some questions, and uh, I think they can be answered on uh, Neurostars then. Cool. And then um, I would like to invite um, the next speaker, uh, who is uh, Katharina Glo. Um, just a second. So I'll invite her on screen. And... Um, she will uh, tell us about cortical integration and segregation explained by harmonic modes of functional connectivity. Yes. Welcome, Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Sharing my screen. Great. I see. Okay. Well, it's working. Yes. Click to close message. You can hide maybe the message at the bottom. Okay. Oh, oh on my screen. Right. That makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> Presentation. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for joining me here to listen to me talk about how harmonic modes of functional connectivity can explain some aspects of cortical integration and segregation in the in humans. Um, okay. So I will first. Oops. Sorry. This shouldn't be so difficult. Okay, um, so when we talk about integration and uh, segregation, we talk about spatiotemporal patterns. And I would just like to take a little step back and look at what physics actually do to describe spatiotemporal patterns uh, in a very basic uh, manner. So, and again, I'm failing at this. Okay, so one uh, very uh, basic thing that we find in physics is the heat or diffusion equation. And um, so what we see immediately is that this is a function of space and time, and we have the derivative of time on one side, and we have the second derivative of space on the other side. And the second derivative can also be abbreviated by this uh, mysterious or not so mysterious delta over here. And the two space changes in space and time are coupled by this parameter alpha. And what this equation describes uh, is just illustrated down here in one example. So if you have in this case, I mean, I chose the neurons, but actually it's more for a continuous medium. So like, let's say you inject something at one place in your medium, and then you look at a later point in time, it will have diffused through your medium. And at some point it will just even out and the concentration will be the same everywhere. And that's the kind of thing that this equation describes. Something a little bit more interesting uh, is described by the wave equation. And I don't know if you've ever seen this kind of experiment performed in front of you. If not, you can uh, watch a YouTube video with this where people hold a rope and they move their hands. And uh, so the, so, and they form a standing wave with this rope. And the faster they move their hands, the, the more nodes will also be in this rope. So again, you can see the coupling between space and time. And in this case, you have the second derivative in time. So you actually get standing waves that keep oscillating instead of just something that evens out. Okay, 
So this mysterious or not so mysterious delta is the so-called Laplace operator or Laplacian. And this is kind of at the heart of the stuff that I'm about to show you. And intuitively, it tells you the difference between a point, what's going on at a point, and the average of its neighbors. So how well can a point be described by the average of its neighbors or not? OK, so what is this Laplacian? So I already mentioned that in these equations, you can see that the spatial and temporal derivatives are separated uh, like on each side of the equation. And it turns out also, if you want to solve these equations, it involves separating space and time, and then you can kind of solve this uh, independently. And the temporal solutions for this kind of stuff, like the heat equation is exponential decay, as I already mentioned, like it will just even out. And for the wave equation, which is maybe more, of more interested, interest here, is something like Fourier series, which we should all be quite familiar with. And now to the part that is most relevant to this talk are the spatial solutions. And you get the spatial solutions. So for example, the shapes of the standing waves in the case of the ropes from the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. And something important that I'm going to mention here and going to come back to later is that just because they're eigenvectors, they also form an orthonormal basis. OK, and what these eigenvectors look like will depend on the domain. So the, the most simple thing and with what we're familiar with is like a linear, circ like a one dimensional circular domain. So that's when we get these sine and cosine waves of different frequencies. But if we have a different domain, for example, here, this uh, also famous example of these 2D metal plates that vibrate, Kladni's plates. Again, you can watch cool videos on YouTube about this. So here you have a metal plate that's the black stuff. And then you put some sand on that. And these plates are excited uh, with some temporal frequency. And the plates will vibrate. And the sand will settle down in these nodal points that don't move. And you can already see one important uh, feature here. So the higher the, fr the frequency with which the temporal frequency is, the more complex these spatial patterns become. And this is something that is, of course, intuitively interesting to the brain. When we look at spherical harmonics, so the, our domain is now a sphere, then we see that uh, Peter Robinson has already done some really fascinating work on this and has shown that if you project spherical harmonics on the cortex, you can find structures that resemble known networks. All right. So in uh, the work that I'm going to show you now, which I did with Selene Atasoy, who is now at Oxford University, we looked at what these kind of basis functions look like when you don't have something like the circle as, a, as your domain, where you have sine and cosine waves, but you have the graph a graph as a domain. So the speaker just now, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, is this idea of connectomics where you represent the brain as a graph that has nodes and edges. So here's just an illustration. And what you then get are basis functions that look like some patterns on the cortical surface. So I mean, you can kind of think of an anal analogy with these standing waves. OK, and just to be a bit more specific about what we actually did here, we went with the Human Connectome Project data. And actually, what they provide is this connectivity matrix, but it's computed from resting state fMRI, so bold signal from 812 subjects. And then we take the correlation between uh, all pairs of vertices on the cortical surface. And we get this massive functional connectivity matrix, which is an average over these 812 subjects. And yes, we didn't use any parcellation. So here we use really the 60,000 by 60,000 functional connectivity matrix. And in order to actually analyze this and do something with this, we create a sparse binary functional connectivity matrix from this by just choosing the 300 nearest neighbors in each row slash column. And as it turns out, even though this is a, a non-continuous, like a discrete and an extremely irregular domain, it's really very simple to get the graph Laplacian. So the graph version of this continuous Laplacian that I've been talking about by just using this adjacency matrix and subtracting it from the degree matrix, which, is, which, just, which just has the number of nearest neighbors in the diagonal. So the result is a, this is a 60,000 by 60,000 matrix that has one, minus one where there's a nearest neighbor and zeros everywhere else except in the diagonal. 
And then we again do this eigen decomposition and we look at the eigenvectors and these are the basis functions that can be used for this uh, brain graph, let's say. All right, so this is just an overview of what they look like. And I just wanna point out, instead of going into like many details here, I just wanna point out some basic properties here. So just like with the Fourier series, which we all know with the sine and cosine waves of different frequencies, these are also ordered by frequency, but here it's, a, it's the graph frequency. So again, it's an irregular domain, so it's maybe not so easy to appreciate, but I think you can see that when you look at the low order ones, so the ones that have low eigenvalues, they have big patches of cortex that have the same color. And then as, as you go to higher eigenvalues, you get smaller patches and more complex patterns, just like what you got with the, like with the metal plates, right? But on the brain. And um, what else did I wanna say? All right, so uh, what's also important to understand here is that what these eigenvectors are, are basically one dimensional projections of the functional connectivity matrix. So the previous speaker just said that um, it's a good idea to connect nodes, or in this case, vertices that have similar neighbors. And this is exactly what happens in this projection. So the vertices that have similar colors in this illustration um, are similar in this projection. So they have a similar position in the graph or something like this. So the closeness in this color space, let's say, is what matters. Okay. Now to get to the actual point, uh, which is just some uh, ways in which this representation captures integration and segregation on the cortex. And I'm just gonna give you two nice examples that I really like, and I'm gonna start with hand areas. So the Human Connectome Project also provides with their, with this uh, wonderful glasser parcellation, some somatotopic areas, namely five on each hemisphere, so 10 in total. And I hope you can see the outlines here and, um, I just chose the three uh, most conspicuous uh, eigenvectors here. And you can see that with the one with the lowest frequency, you have all the somatotopic areas integrated together. So they have the same color, which means they are similar in this dimension according to this graph frequency. When you go to a higher uh, frequency, you can actually see how the different somatotopic areas are segregated. So you can see in orange, the hand areas on each side and the blue stuff is here, uh, what would correspond to feet or uh, legs. And down here you have the face area, but they're still symmetric across the hemispheres. And in this uh, 11th functional harmonic, uh, this is one of my personal favorites. You can really see the separation between the right and the left hand, which makes a lot of sense because, okay, our hands are similar, but also often the left hand does something different from the right hand. Um, right. And again, uh, this just arises from this ordering by frequencies. And another nice example is this uh, area MT, so middle temporal area, which is like a higher visual area. Is it even higher? Uh, I mean, it's responsible for motion. So here I'm just showing the map of seed correlations. So the area of interest is here, this yellow patch, and you can just see the correlation to the other hemisphere, for example, and this map that kind of engulfs the entire brain. But of course, the idea is that brain areas have different functions in different contexts. Oh. It was obscured. Okay, so if we just, so here's again the seed correlation. Now I'm showing again three different uh, functional harmonics or yeah, which are just these eigenvectors. And you can see that uh, this area now kind of is connected or is close together according to the colors with different, within different networks and connected to other areas. So for example, in this component, we can see an integration with auditory areas. So we have this audiovisual kind of processing stream, let's say. Um, in the sixth harmonic, we see the sensory motor pathway, which is something that is talked about at length, for example, in this Yale 2011 seven resting set networks paper, and it really corresponds super nicely. And in the, in the eighth functional harmonic, you can see this uh, ventral stream. So you have this, this fusiform phase complex, for example, integrated with uh, this area. And what I also find interesting in this one is that another area that turns up here is, the, is again, the somatotopic face area. So it's like other people's faces and your own face. Okay. So what, uh, what we're trying to say with this is that because you have each functional harmonic related to a unique spatial graph frequency and these eigenvectors are orthogonal 
and also the separation by spatial frequencies um, is theoretical connect, theoretically connected to a separation by temporal frequencies, this could mean that this is a way of describing how the same brain area con can fulfill multiple functions. And that is by being part of multiple of these communication channels, which are separated in the way that I just mentioned. <clears throat> okay. Okay, something else that I want to mention here is uh, kind of this discussion is, I see this uh, more often now, so I wanted to include this. So we have this kind of apparent discrepancy between the notion of parcels, and I have been talking about parcels and areas, and this idea that we have um, gradients in general. So I was talking about continuous gradients. And so how does this go together? Because in the brain, we, we clearly have both. So on the one hand, we have parcels where the idea is that they are functionally, psycho-architecturally, and also connectivity-wise, more or less homogeneous. And the idea is that these different parcels uh, kind of integrate in a modular fashion with other functional areas to fulfill different functions. And then there's this idea of gradients where we have continuously varying function also within a brain region. And this is supported by this uh, findings of like topographic mapping. So retinotopy, somatotopy, and <clears throat> tonotopy, but also these large scale connectivity gradients, which are also being discussed more and more. And I just want to point out that our first two functional harmonics look exactly the same as what is found by Margulies and others in 2016, where they used a different technique and which has also now been shown to be present in many other kinds of data. So, um, Intuitively, when we just looked at these gradients, and I, I mentioned this before with the hand areas, you can see that even though you have a continuous gradient, these like the, the lines, let's say, where the colors are the same, so the ISO lines of these gradients, they seem to follow the borders of the parcels in the parcellation. And here I'm just get, showing one example as an illustration, but uh, you can do this for any of the harmonics, and you can see that really the these the the parcel borders from this glass of parcellation follow these uh, gradients quite well. And even, even more clearly to explain what I mean is if you, uh, if you consider that these dimensions, so these different eigenvectors, of course, act together to describe the organization of the cortex, you can imagine that parcels emerge in multiple dimensions. So I just plotted here again, the two of these somatotopic hand examples that I showed before and if you just plot the gradient in like this continuous space, one against the other, then you see that it's a continuous gradient. So there's not like patches or anything, but the, but the blobs that you can observe on the surface, they emerge from the continuous gradient. So clearly you can say that the vertices that are plotted here belong to the left hand and the ones that are plotted here are, belong to the right hand. And uh, we quantified this, like how well do these lines really follow the gradients? And we found that when we use functional harmonics, so these are the first 11 functional harmonics that I showed you before in this list. And this is the quantification of how well they follow the parcel borders overall. So the maximum value you can achieve is of course one. You can see that it's pretty good for most of them. Even the worst ones are still at like 0.65, which is still a good correspondence. And without going into details, because I'm running out of time, I just want to say that we also compared this to other uh, to other possible basis functions, uh, namely to principal components and also to independent components. And you see that the circles, so these are like the real uh, gradients that we used, they perform worse than for the function harmonics, and they're also not significant. So the gray uh, things are rotations, uh, so like random gradients, let's say. So um, this is all that I wanted to show you. And thank you. And uh, please ask away if you have any questions. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Um, there's a question from Bauter Klein. He asks, if I understand correctly, the harmonic series are derived from the functional connectome. Can the harmonic be reduced to more specific biological um, mechanisms, delta waves, correlated spike trains, neuron tracks, etc. So basically, um, I just took the easy way out by saying that there's a theoretical 
connection to like temporal frequency, so like to actual dynamics. But yeah, we didn't we didn't analyze this, but there is now work emerging, and I just want to name and just I just want to mention Ashish Raj, who uh, has a paper out on simulating the nodes of the network with an with an actual I think he was using a mean field model to simulate the dynamics and show how these patterns can actually emerge from uh, the interplay between these local models and the connectome and how some oscillations, for example, alpha oscillations in the correct places of the brain can emerge from these two mechanisms together. So we didn't make the link, but we believe that the link is there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we are already uh, at the time for the next speaker, so I will relegate uh, the remaining questions to uh, Neurostars. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and I will invite the next speaker, um, who is uh, Pedro Mediano. Who will um, tell us about reconciling emergences, an information theoretic approach to identify causal emergence in multivariate data. Welcome. Uh, hello, hello. Let me try and share my screen. There we are. That works. And you can, yeah, perfect. Amazing. Cool. Right. Thanks everyone for joining and for making it this far. Um, I'm going to presenting. I'm going to be presenting this uh, paper that you can search. It's available on the archive. It's called "Reconciling Emergences: An Information Theoretic Approach to Identify Causal Emergence in Multivariate Data." And much like Daniel Polanyi's e the keynote earlier today, uh, we're going to be dealing with mostly conceptual and mathematical principles rather than specific neurophysiological imp implementations of those principles. Um, and I should briefly acknowledge the people that I did this work in collaboration with. So mostly Fernando Rosas from Imperial College, but also Daniel Bohr from the University of Cambridge and Adam Barrett from the University of Sussex, as well as other collaborators, Ian Seth, Henrik Jensen and Robin Card harris Cool. So let's start talking about emergence, what it is and why it matters. So emergence is a topic that um, features prominently, typically many discussions around neuroscience and neural behavior and collective behavior more generally. And we all have an informal idea of what emergence is. You know, there's something like, you know, the whole being more than the sum of its parts. Um, and we find emergence in many sort of man-made and social and natural phenomena. And I hope I don't have to convince you, to try very hard to convince you that the brain is one such system that we believe to be emergent. Uh, for example, look no further than in Catherine's talk a few minutes ago, where she was talking about emergent patterns of, you know, from the harmonics or whatnot. Um, so what I'm going to be trying to do in this talk is basically try to clarify what is it that we mean when we say that something emerges from something else. Like try to give a mathematical theory behind these philosophical concepts. Uh, and when it comes to thinking about emergence, there's a bunch of theories that um, are lying around. One of them is reductionism. That basically says there's no emergence, there's only physics, and the plasma is demon rocks. So if I know the exact position of all the molecules and the moment, the velocities of positions of every molecule inside the duck, then I can predict everything. I can know everything that's going on inside that duck. Um, alternatively, on the other hand, there's emergentism that says that some things cannot be explained by the microstate of a system, whatever that microstate might be. Um, there's a few schools in here. One is strong emergence that says that true emergence is possible in principle, right? So it doesn't matter how well you know string theory or how well you know the position of every particle in the universe, you will never be able to predict social phenomena like communism. Um, on the other hand, there's this other flavor of emergentism called weak emergence that says that emergence is only apparent in practice. And this is typically this is most prominently embodied by the thought of Stephen Wolfram. Uh, the basis says if you have one of these funky class four cellular automata, um, the only way you can predict what's going to happen is by knowing the exact state of everything and running an exhaustive simulation and there's no explanatory shortcut um but however if you read this literature you know i, I am myself always left with the question of you know what are we actually doing 
And, you know, there's lots of pillow fights between reductionists and emergentists about what we mean by things. But, you know, these are typically just deferred to the realm of philosophy. And what we wanted to do with this work is, well, can we stop arguing and measure something? Um, and we believe this is relevant for neuroscience and especially for my field, uh, consciousness neuroscience, because a lot of claims about, you know, consciousness being strongly emergent and there's a hard problem of consciousness or whatnot. So let's try and put a finger down on what these intuitions are and how can we mathematize them. Uh, so let's begin with a minimal example of what we mean by emergence. And we're going to look for these sort of features or these properties of some dynamical property that's in the whole but not in the parts of a system. And let's try to find a very, very tiny minimal new, uh, system with two binary variables. Think of them as neurons going on or off, that they have some particular state. And then with some probability gamma, the future has the same parity as the past. And otherwise, they have the opposite parity and everything else is random. If you just draw a sample from the system and let it run for a bit, you will see that it looks like something like this. So there's some structure. The two neurons are sort of the same at first, then they swap and the different to each other and then they swap again and they are become correlated again. But the thing with the system is that actually, if you look at it on the whole, the dynamics are not visible in any subset of the system. So many measures don't pick this up. If you compute things like transfer entropy or mutual information or some flavors of integrated information, phi, those are all zero, right? So if you look at any subset of the system, you won't see anything at all. You will only see some meaningful dynamics if you look at the whole system. Uh, and we're going to take this minimal example of causal emergence, a case in which the whole system has some causal effect on itself, but on none of the parts, but on their own. Um, so just a brief outline, what we're going to be doing is we're going to have this setting where we have a multivariate system X with N parts that evolves from T to T prime. And we have some supervening on some sort of possibly emergent feature V that we can compute from the state of the system at each time. And first of all, we're going to provide the formal definition of causal emergence. Basically, what does it take for V to emerge with respect to X? Then we're going to distinguish between two different kinds of emergence that we're going to call causal decoupling and downward causation. And these terms will be explained in a few, in a few slides later. And then we'll propose a fractal criterion so it's an action to actually go and you know, formulate hypotheses about emergence in empirical data and go and answer it, you know, see if that data has an emergent property or not. So in order to do that, I'm going to make use of a particular branch of information theory known as information decomposition, which I'm going to cover. I'm going to introduce very quickly, um, just in minimal detail to get you familiar with some of the concepts. So in, in partial information decomposition, this paper, this pretty seminal paper by Williams and Beer in 2010, Let's say that we have two predictors, x1, x2, and one target, x. Think of them as, for example, two, neuron respond, two neurons responding to one particular stimulus. You can try and decode the stimulus from both neurons, and that will give you some joint predictability, i of x1, x2, com, uh, semicolon y. Or you can calculate the marginal predictabilities of both neurons separately. And sometimes it happens that the whole is more than some of the parts. So the predictability you get with both neurons is a lot greater than could be potentially a lot greater than you get with the sum of the parts. And in PID, we have this PID postulate that splits this information to four bits. One is called the redundancy, the unique information, and the synergy. The redundancy is basically the information that both neurons have independently, meaning that it's encoded redundantly. So you could read the same information if you look at only x1 or only x2. You could also be looking at the unique information that only x1 or only x2 has. Or more interestingly, you have this bit that's called the synergy. That's the information you can have access to if you look at x1, x2 at the same time, but that you lose if you don't observe any one of them. Uh, and the perfect example of synergy is the XOR gate that you can see depicted here. And the XOR gate has this particular property that if you know one of the inputs to the gate it tells you nothing at all, so mutual information is zero. But if you know both inputs, that tells you everything, right? So knowing both, you have perfect information about the output, but if you know only one of them, you know nothing at all, so this is a perfect synergy. Um, so we've just seen that PID decomposes information that two or potentially many sources have about one single target, but typically we care about multivariate systems that evolve jointly over time. So we have this system with X1 through Xn evolving from T to T prime, and really, PID doesn't quite cut it. 
because we have you know a, several time series going on simultaneously instead of one like privileged target that we want to sort of highlight and decompose its information so one question is can we extend PID to multi-variate time series the answer you'll be shocked to hear is yes with this concoct -co that we devised that's called integrated information decomposition or FIID which you can read up in this paper if you're interested or you could come to the IT methods workshop on Wednesday to see my talk with more details about this and some of the other work that we've been doing. So basically this information decomposition, both PID and FIID are gonna be the mathematical backbone of our work. The only thing you need to take home from these few slides is the concept of synergy and basically that we have a clear mathematical idea of what is, how to characterize information that's in several variables, but not in any subset of them. So now with these tools, let's go on, let's try to define emergence. Uh, and very briefly, I'm just gonna make a quick note on notation. Um, we need to define a coarse grain PID. So I'm going to introduce two quantities. This UN XYZ is the unique information that X has about Y that no individual variable ZI has. And this sin is a synergy, basically information about Y that no individual XI has, but X as a whole does. Very briefly define a bit of notation, this unique and synergistic information there. Cool, so let's now go and jump in and define emergence. Um, again, we have this setting where we have this system with n components. We have x uh, that we measure at regular discrete time intervals, xt. And then we have a candidate emergent feature, v, that we take to be a function of the state of the system at time t. And with this, we say that v is a supervenient feature of x. Um, so informally, again, we have this idea that a feature v is emergent if it says something about the feature that individual microscopic elements of the system don't say about the feature of the system. Um, more formally, we can use all these tools that we've been sort of uh, looking at very briefly about unique and synergistic information and say that, you know, a supervenient feature V f of x exhibits causal emergence if its unique information with respect to the feature of the system is greater than zero. Basically, if V tells me something about the feature that the individual elements of the system don't. And there's a definition that is sort of perfectly mathematically well-defined and that captures to some degree this intuition of the whole being more than the sum of the parts in this causal sense, in the sense of you know, being able to predict the future of the system. Uh, and then you know, there's a definition that we put forward, basically that we just pulled up a sleeve because we believe it matches our intuition. Um, and from here on, we're basically just going to use the properties of these information theoretic terms and sort of drive some results from it. The first thing we can do is actually to realize that, well, actually to compute this unique information, we need to know VT in advance. So we need to know what the emergent feature could be. But there are many cases in which we don't have any idea. We're just looking at data and want to see, well, is there anything emergent in here? So the solution to this is to use more PID. And we can prove that actually a system has causally emergent features if and only if it has synergy in its dynamical evolution. So if the uh, elements of the system are synergistic with respect to their feature, then we know that there exists some V that is causally emergent according to the definition above. So the synergy quantifies the emergence capacity of a system. And we can do this basically without imposing any particular feature that we want to um, look at. And this basically is an intrinsic criterion based only on the dynamics of the system. Um, and not only that, but actually we can make a taxonomy of emergence. Um, so this previous definition tells us whether there is emergence in a particular system, but it doesn't tell us what kind of emergence it is. And for that, we're going to introduce two new types of emergence, two new definitions. One is downward causation. That is when macroscopic features affect individual elements. And this seems to capture this notion of, you know, you have some emergent property floating above, and that is sort of directing or causally affecting individual elements in the system. Uh, and we're going to differentiate that from another um, mode of emergence, so to speak, that we haven't seen previously reported, uh, that we call causal decoupling. And that is basically macroscopic features that affect other macroscopic features, but not any elements in particular. And so more graphically and mathematically, these are the formal definitions of both. So downward causation is this unique information that some sort of microscopic features, some 
emergent features have towards some particular elements of the system. And causal decoupling is a particularly funny one, which we actually think of as a sort of statistical ghost. Because you know, these causal decoupling um, features, is these, basically they it's like statistical patterns that operate at a higher level of abstraction, so to speak, and affect each other, but at no point are affected by or affect individual elements of the system. So they're like patterns that move around and affect each other without ever sort of touching the individual elements of the system. And we refer to these as statistical ghosts, sometimes only partially joking. Um, and using these theories of this theory of phi ID, we can actually decompose analytically the emergence capacity of the system into these two terms that adds up perfectly. Uh, it adds up to the sum of this causal decoupling term G for ghost and the downward causation term D. Um, we can go on and look at a few examples of this thing. Um, so for example, we have these systems that, as before are binary neurons evolving, time goes from left to right, and these neurons can just be on or off. And there's a feature, take V as the parity of X. Um, so in the system on the left, we have this, basically this very simple sort of ring copy system where every time step, every neuron is transferring one bit of information to the neuron next to it. And that thing is not emergent, right? Because at any point in time, you can predict what the, what one neuron is doing from the past state of the neuron next to it. So there's no higher level, there's no effect that you need to that needs to invoke any collective property of the system to predict the feature. So that's not emergent. Um, however, on the system in the middle, we can have multiple neurons whose XOR, whose parity affects one particular neuron in the future, and that is emergent, and in fact, it has downward causation, because we have one synergistic property of the past that is driving the activity of one particular neuron. Uh, and an example on the right, we have an example of causal decoupling, and that's actually the same system as in my slide earlier on, um, whereby the XOR, the parity of a group of neurons, is determining the parity of another group of neurons in the future. And we see this sort of causal decoupling in which the parity affects itself, but it doesn't affect any of the individual neurons. Um, so these are simple, minimal examples. But you know, one thing, if you're any familiar with these tools of PID or information theory more generally, you probably know that actually it's kind of hard to estimate these things in practice. So if we were to apply these to empirical data, we need to do a bit more work. And to do that, we propose this practical tool or this practical criterion that we call Psi. And we can actually prove that if Psi is greater than zero, then a feature V is causally emergent. So basically, if you give me some recordings X and some feature V, which you believe might be emergent, then I can very, very easily compute this thing based on standard Shannon mutual information. And then if this thing is greater than zero, then we can conclude that your system, that V, that your feature is causally emergent with respect to your system. Um, and this has a bunch of pros. For example, it uses only standard mutual information, and there's lots of literature on how to estimate this. It uses only pairwise mar marginals, so there's no curves of dimensionality and no nasty scaling, and there's no false positives. So if you know that this thing is positive, then you know that your system is emergent. Uh, on the other hand, there's a few cons. So this thing needs a candidate feature V. Yeah, you need to propose something. And it also double counts redundancy. So if your system is highly redundant, then this criterion will be less sensitive. And also, if this thing is smaller than zero, then it's really inconclusive. You don't know if the system is really not emergent or if it is emergent, but your criterion is failing. So, so far, we have formulated a rigorous definition of causal emergence, provided an intrinsic criteria of causal emergence based on synergy, decomposed emergence into downward causation and statistical ghosts or causal decoupling, and provided some practical tools to test for emergence in data. So let's now very quickly go and highlight a few of these case studies. Um, so first, we can look at the canonical example of emergence, which is this game of life. And the game of life is this cellular automaton developed by John Conway quite a bit of time ago, where you have these cells that evolve looking at their neighbors and you can have these sort of fancy stable patterns that people call particles. And we set up these cellular automaton with a bunch of particles. Uh, on, that's the initial condition is on the left. Then they collide and they do some stuff. And then typically some other particles are formed in the final state on the right. Uh, so if we take as a micro variable the cell state and we take a macro variable the particle type, then we can compute this thing and we actually see that in fact, this thing is positive 
and therefore the game of life is emergent. So the presence of particles and the interactions between particles are an emergent property of the game of life. Uh, I'm going to skip this example. I'm going to go to the final example of uh, neural activity under during motor control. Um, so in this case, we use uh, ECOG data from a macaque monkey undergoing a reaching task. And the micro variable is going to be the ECOG channel, 64 ECOG channels on the left hemisphere of this monkey. And there's a macro variable, the decoded hand motion in 3D space. So the XYZ in this plot represents the XY space, uh, the XYZ coordinates of the monkey's right wrist. Um, and in here we have the, in blue, in this plot, we have the measured position of the monkey's wrist. Uh, but because of course, there's many sources of information and variability that are not being captured by the ECOG, what we do is we train this decoder using a support vector machine, and that's the orange line. And the orange line is sort of the decoded hand motion that represents the component of motor behavior that is encoded in this, in this recorded ECOG. And we can go on and compute this psi criterion in blue at the top right. And in fact, that is also positive, so it is emergent. But this um, sort of the degree of emergence sort of decreases over time uh, as, you, as, your time, as your prediction time horizon goes into the future. But we can see that in fact, the representation of motor activity on this ECOG is an emergent property of the neural activity. Uh, so finally, to wrap up, uh, we propose a quantitative rigorous theory of causal emergence. Our theory agrees with intuition in paradigmatic examples of, of emergence, such as the game of life. And there's a new family of information metrics that we can use to analyze neural or other types of data. And again, more details. For more details, please join us in the information theory methods workshop on Wednesday. And that'll be all by me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for this uh, interesting talk. Um, let's quickly ask uh, a question. So uh, Thomas Novotny asks, so would you make the claim that causal decoupling is strong emergence or is it still a case of weak emergence? What I would say is that actually causal decoupling is showing the strength of weak emergence. Right? Because this is still epistemic in the sense of, well, if you knew the exact state of every part of the system and you knew the sort of generating model precisely, then you could predict everything. But the fact that as soon as you stop observing something, then there's a whole range of phenomena that can happen. Causal decoupling being one of the weirder ones. Uh, so my answer would be, causal decoupling is still within the realms of weak emergence, but it shows how funky weak emergence can be without invoking the weird metaphysical commitments of strong emergence. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will uh, move the other questions to Neurostars and uh, thank you again. Thanks everyone for, for attending the session. And see you next time.